Elizabeth Satoris. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's so wonderful to be here again, and it's such a feast we've had these few days. Isn't it been a feast? We're like stuffed with non-duality. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, that's emptiness. <laughs> so you can't gain weight on it. <laughs> but we've had the loveliest weather, the most beautiful setting. Maurizio and Zaya and the whole team have been so wonderful to us. And they're always so in the flow. And to all of you, give yourselves a hand for coming out. <laughs> We're all one. Well, I gave this talk at least six different versions of it in the night last night. <laughs> and I wrestled with myself about should I show the slides I made for the talk or not? Will I connect better if I just don't bother with the slides? There's too many of them or what? But what happened in the night was really Lothar who challenged me right there on, I think, the first day. Is he still here? I don't think so. Okay. Anyway, when he said, why is it that biologists sort of refuse to incorporate physics or to recognize physics and chemistry as the basis of life. And, and I said back to him, because we've been given a physics of non-life, because we've been given a kind of chemistry of non-life, even though uh, we, we split chemistry into organic and non-organic uh, chemistry, it's still little machines, right? Um, we used to... We used to see the pictures of molecules in books as tinker toys. Are, are you all old enough to know what tinker toys are? You know, sticks and balls stuck together to, to make models of molecules. And nowadays, if you go onto the internet and you look for videos of molecules, you can see them moving around and stuff, but they're still called molecular machinery and they've just sort of coated the tinker toys with Play-Doh and, and now they're purple and yellow and stuff, and, and the proteins are chugging along like an engine on your DNA and <laughs> making, you know, arms come out and things do stuff. And uh, it's still molecular machinery. We're still stuck with all these mechanical metaphors. So we talk about the, the mechanism of our nervous system and all that. And that's what I, as a biologist, rebel against because organism is not mechanism. When you walk away from your computer, you hope it doesn't change while you're gone, because they're not noted for changing themselves for the better. So it's, if they change, then it's going to be for the worse. But if you walk away from a friend, you hope they do keep changing while you're gone, because otherwise they're dead, right? So you want them to stay alive, and to be alive, you have to constantly keep changing yourself. Every one of your hundred trillion cells has 30,000 recycling centers in it to keep these little proteins new. But they're not like our chipper machines, where when you stick a dead tree in the, in the machine, you get chips out the other end. These, these recycling centers, you stick the molecule in and you get a new live molecule out the other end. It's like getting a live tree out the other side of your chipper machine. You know, life doesn't operate by the same principles as machinery. And machinery does require an inventor. And life doesn't, because life is the inventor. Life is all that is. All that is, is life. So, you want to see some pictures? Okay. <laughs> anyway, I was diving around between the molecular world and the cosmos and everything in between, and ethics and economics and stuff, because I am a cosmic snoop, as I was introduced this morning on the panel. And I, and I do want to know how things work, so I jump levels, because life is the same at all levels. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about a cell or a global economy or a family or what. The principles of organization will be the same. So. 
the nature of perception, pretty much sort of a collage of the first part of the talk, and the perception of nature is a collage that just continues. So um, what sets humans apart from the rest of nature, I believe, is our storytelling feature. Uh, we invent language to communicate with each other. Everything else in nature communes. Direct transmission, total authenticity, no faking, no telling a story to manipulate uh, each other, right? So they're in direct contact. If your cells weren't communing all the time, if all your cells didn't know what the other ones were doing, if they weren't in this cosmos knowing what everything else is doing, you wouldn't work very well. And that's ignored on the whole by biology. And we, um, we perceive realities that reflect these stories and beliefs. That's the problem. We, we have heard some wonderful lectures about direct perception. Can you drop your stories? Can you clear your mind and perceive purely? It's very hard because most of our perception comes through the stories we already have built in. Our built-in belief system is the filter through which we perceive. How many of you saw the movie Cave of Forgotten Dreams? A handful of you. Try to find it somewhere, you know, it, probably out on video by now. Um, but it's about a cave that's 35,000 years old with these beautiful paintings in the cave. And if you think about that time when people were surviving in the middle of an ice age, in a snowed over forest, in which there were lions and tigers and, and mammoths and rhinoceroses and cave bears and bison and all these things. Do you think those people survived, those naked little two-legged survived in that kind of situation by being hostile to these creatures? I don't think so. And I think that art reflects love and communion and arrangements for who dies to feed whom when. So we have this, this Hollywood notion of, of cave people, you know, all bopping each other over the head with clubs, instead of realizing that only through cooperation with each other and with such animals could, could we have, have ever survived these things. And we survived at least a dozen ice ages. So every human culture has some kind of cosmology or creation story to live by. Uh, it's the way we glue our societies together. We talk, we tell these stories, and we believe these stories, and they become people's realities. And the major world religions, I found, kind of divide the way, the way I just talked about computers and your friend, life and a mechanism and organism. A mechanism always has an intelligent entity behind it that assembled it, that put it together, that created that machine. And a living entity grows from the inside, from a seed or an egg. It evolves itself over time and generations as well. And I realized long after I thought that up that the religions can kind of be divided the same way where the Abrahamic religions have this duality of a god and that god's creation while the Eastern religions tend to see a sea of consciousness in which things self-create. Now, there are mystical traditions in the desert religions as well, and those contemplative branches of those religions are more like the Eastern, what I call autopoetic, self-creating universe religions, rather than allopoetic, other-created. And this will become important, um, but first let me say, in most cultures until now, people had one creation story and their realities coincided far more than ours do. Their dream symbols were far more shared than ours are. We're the first culture that has had such a variety of stories in all of history. If you look at indigenous cultures all the way from the Stone Age to the, to the present, their story tends to be more that I and all of my world are alive and intertwined and interdependent, right? That's, that's how they live. They lived in a kind of understanding self and wholeness, 
understanding the eternal now and linear time. So in some ways, I think they've been more sophisticated than what we did. We did a strange experiment in our Western culture. It's an unprecedented one. So as I just said, a lot of indigenous cultures live easily with this duality of linear time and the now, which is what non-duality we've just been hearing all about. We, we in cosmic mind, I call it big mind, big mind, gets thoughts, thinks things up, makes worlds, you know, has to do dualities when it gets down to the physical because it doesn't work very well without them, but it's still all oneness, isn't it? So our Western culture grew up through a series of events, starting with the Enlightenment. Of course, you can go further back in history. But the Enlightenment and industrial enterprise, the invention of machinery, big-time invention of machinery, and then giving rise to secular states, okay? And when that happened, the authority to tell this cosmology story, this creation story, shifts from the religions to science, okay? And science now is mandated like a priesthood in society to tell the official creation story. So what kind of a story was it? We start basically with people like Newton and Descartes talking about a mechanical universe invented by God. Descartes said God is the grand engineer, and he invents the machinery of nature. And he puts a piece of God mind in his favor, into his favorite robot, which is man. Not woman, just man. And then man too, man too can create machinery. Okay? It's kind of a logically complete worldview because you have two levels of intelligence in God and man because man reflects God and they both make machinery. And it didn't occur to these guys that they were projecting their, <laughs> their ability to make machinery onto God, you know, because they said it was the other way around. And uh, so what happens with that is that it's fairly logical to have this sort of four-step situation. But what happens when you throw God out of this picture? When, when Laplace said, I have no need for the hypothesis of God, you throw out all the intelligence, all the purpose, and then you run around claiming that machinery just happens by accident. And literally, when I was trained in, in the 1950s, uh, we were told if enough parts of an airplane blow around in a junkyard, eventually an airplane will assemble, and you all know the, the many m monkeys at a typewriter will eventually, one will type Dostoevsky. And I say, you cannot tell that story to a woman, even if she is a robot, <laughs> because she will immediately think of all the banana peels and the monkey doo-doo and the waste paper and the ribbons, the typewriters rusting, and your universe becoming so clogged with stuff before you ever get a paragraph of Dostoevsky, right? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> it threw out purpose, intelligence, and creativity with God, and then children get told that what comes out of their minds, what they maybe download and stuff, it's all your imagination, right? So don't let People say that to little children. Uh, Vedanta science, which isn't recognized by Western science, always perceived consciousness as a source of reality. I don't have to tell this group about that. Uh, but because Western science rejected these inner ways of knowing, the inner sciences, the research that can be done from that perspective, um, you know, it limited itself. And maybe we had to do this experiment to see what happens if we separate, if we pretend we're, our minds are capable of pretending we're separate from the whole. That's a weird thing. Your dog and cat can't do that. A grasshopper can't do that. A bacterium certainly can't do it. You know, so it's a new experiment. And in my universe, there are no laws because I don't know that there's any lawgiver. But there are regularities, and I, Rupert Sheldrake and I both came to the con this same kind of story I'm talking long before we knew anything about each other. And, um, 
Anyway, uh, <laughs> let me go on. Um, <laughs> West, Western science tells you that the only thing that's real in the world is what you can touch and taste and feel and measure, right? And in some cases, at least, Eastern science says, what you touch, taste, feel, that's not real, right? The real, and some of us in this room subscribe to this view of things and others don't. And that's the beauty of this conference is that we have people coming from different perspectives even on the subject of non-duality. So I think that's quite important. Now, these science fiction characters are actual creatures of this planet. Um, so, you know, it may surprise us to see those in our reality because it looks like something Hollywood invented, doesn't it? Those costumes. I love finding stuff like this on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> So I have a, an informally adopted son named Puma. Um, where's my... Here, here. Yeah. He's a little older now. That's a brand new baby. Puma learned to deliver babies at age 12. His grandfather teacher... What? I'm, am I going, going the wrong way? <laughs> I want to go back. <laughs> there. There we are. Okay. Um, his grandfather teacher is here, Don Maximo Singona Puma. Puma Singona. It goes that way. And Puma the kid. And Puma was trained for 21 years, from age 3 to 24, to be a medicine priest, not only delivering babies, but setting bones and doing herbal medicine and doing all those ceremonies in thunderstorms for many hours at a time, just moving souls from darkness to light and stuff like that. Very, very profound teachings. And in his culture, reality is defined simply as everyone's personal experience and collective experience. And the first rule of the culture is Tell me your perceptions, your reality truly. Don't distort it to manipulate me, and then I'll accept it as your reality without having to make it my own. Nice, huh? So I look through my culture, and I actually find one dictionary in which the fourth definition works, because the first three had the word real in them. So you had to throw them out. It doesn't help you to read that reality is what's real, does it? So uh, the fourth one was non-derivative experience as a definition of reality. That's exactly the definition of Puma's culture, non-derivative experience. Now, you can have a non-derivative experience of a book, right, or of a television show. It's yours, your personal experience of it. Everybody in here who writes books knows that no two people read your book as the same book that you've, you've written as many books as there are people who are going to read them. And sometimes you're amazed when people come up to you and tell you what was in your book, right? <laughs> so this is very important. I think this is just the most beautiful definition of reality because it's so tolerant. And if we all practiced this kind of, of definition of reality, Dr. Phil, the pop scientist made famous by Oprah, would say 90% of arguments among married people or couples you know, would disappear because they'd be willing to accept two different realities about something without going through a bullying process where one wins and the other one gives in. Right? You just say, ah, oh, we have different realities on that. Let's talk about something else. There's always enough common collective reality to build a culture on, it turns out. So, what's our most basic continual experience? And it's something we talk about a lot here. And one of them is, everything happens within my consciousness. And my consciousness doesn't seem to have any boundaries. If tomorrow they tell me the universe is 10 times as big as they thought it was, okay, I can accommodate that. I just expand my, my perception, right? Very nice. But we've, none of us have ever been out of our consciousness. If people in a coma have experience, it just means that they are still conscious, whether they're brain dead or not, right? So we know, Pim von Lommel gave a lovely talk about that. And the other one that's so obvious is this, <laughs> always now. So we can, get, we can go out of body, but we can't go out of mind. 
And we can think about tomorrow and yesterday, but we can't, but we can only do it now, right? Now, how is it that science can ignore such basic truths that all of us can agree on? But it did. You would think that a really meaningful scientific worldview would take such things into account, but it doesn't. So, um, <laughs> There are some exceptions in the sci among science. Now, this is a brand new slide that I made after hearing Bernardo's talk yesterday. And he was saying, what if the brain, or I, he believes that the brain is, and so do I, a self-localizing pattern within cosmic consciousness? It's a different way of, of saying, you know, either the brain creates consciousness or consciousness creates the brain. When you really see the oneness, you just say, this is happening, this materialization, this concentration is happening within this ocean of consciousness. So I thought that was beautiful enough to warrant a slide. And William James always said, consciousness is a perch and a flight. In other words, each of you have a point of focus, knowing yourself as a self and having the whole universe, no boundaries to how far you can fly from that perch. Each of us is a unique perspective on the whole universe, and that is why no two people can have the same reality. You can't see exactly the same thing from different positions. And a material world has space-time in it. So there are positions within it. I like to think of cosmic consciousness, the Brahman, the all, as big mind. And then our human consciousness, my experience, I'm little mind. I'm here on the perch looking into big mind from my perspective, but my perch is inside big mind. And so why can't I think of big mind as having thoughts the way my mind has thoughts? Thoughts arise, thoughts pass. Sometimes you do things with thoughts. Sometimes you materialize them by inventing something that you thought of. And everything we see in our human world was once in somebody's mind as a thought, or it wouldn't have been here, right? It's created. I sometimes think that the point of having physical universes is to unpack the creative process, to slow it down. In your dream, all you have to do is think of us of flowers and it's there. In reality, physical reality, we have to find the seeds and plant them and nurture them and grow them and cut the flowers and all those things, or build a table or whatever we want to materialize out of thought. We have to go through a step-by-step -step process, like creation unpacked, not there instantly. So my favorite metaphor, and I think it, it goes quite nicely with Bernardo's, is a keyboard of vibrations, right? We've all been told the universe is nothing but vibrations. So what are those vibrations about? Within this sea of cosmic consciousness, we have that gelled, slowed down vibrations of matter. And then science, a little over a century ago, became able to measure electromagnetic energy. So that got into the reality view of Western science. And then Einstein came along and showed us it was the same thing. It's just you can transform one into the other, and that's half of our symbol for this conference, isn't it? The MC squared part. And now we're up to zero point energy in the world of Western science. And what, what's up at the other end of the keyboard? That's where all that mind-spirit stuff is. So the, the spiritual people look down the keyboard, and the scientists look up the keyboard, and they take them a long time to figure out there's only one keyboard. Right? And that keyboard is us, and that keyboard is the whole material world if it goes down into that slower range. So Norbert Wiener said, we are not stuff that abides, but patterns that perpetuate themselves, whirlpools of water in an ever-flowing river. Brain itself as a whirlpool within the ever-flowing river. Whirlpools at the subatomic particle level, whirlpools at our level, whirlpools up and down. It's like whirlpools all the way down instead of turtles. <laughs> Irvin Schrodinger, while our world picture is a construct of consciousness 
and cannot be proved to have any other existence, we leave mind out of the picture. It's a strange way that Western science operates. It's strange. It's wonderful because it gives us all this technology. It gives us our iPads and spaceships and, and diagnostic machinery and, and microscopes and telescopes, and we want all that stuff. But it has a little trouble understanding life. But before I get into that, let me just say, I said before that we're the first culture with so many different stories. And in fact, you know, it's very hard for young people to figure out what's real and what should I believe and what do I not believe and how do I do that uh, when we have so many stories and we have to make sense of all these different stories. And this is a huge exercise now in tolerance. And I ask you, you know, how many people in this room have close family members that live in a very different reality from yours? Uh, I better ask it the other way to see it. <laughs> because it look, this group seems to be virtually 100% on this question. Uh, there probably, if there were some of you, there were very few of you who haven't had this experience. Now, how do you love family members and get along with them when they have such a completely different reality? And, of course, love is the key. And uh, I can tell you some funny stories about my, my own family, but I'll... I'll refrain from that in order to move on. <laughs> what is the meaning of a rose when every rose is a different rose in a different context? You know, you can't say that the rose is the same to the donkey or to the scientist or to the lover or to the artist. It isn't, because what the rose is is an interaction. Isn't it? It's an interaction within oneness between the whirlpool that's you and the whirlpool that's the rose and the whirlpool that's the donkey and the whirlpool that's the artist. And uh, so this building up of tolerance among young people today is very, very important. Because when you're in, living in a world full of such huge crises, it's very easy for people to fall into pointing fingers and being angry or divorcing themselves from all of that just to be very pure and non-dual. So if we want to live in this world, and how many of you think you're here intentionally as an incarnation? Anybody think you incarnated intentionally into this present world? Am I the only one who thinks I'm here by... I have a couple of people. Wow, I'm surprised. It's such a fun hypothesis, <laughs> such a fun story. And I like Michael Newton's books a lot on life between lives. And, and as Pim said, there's such a big literature on it nowadays to see not just what did I do in, in this or that past life, and I think those are all now if you want to contact them, um, but, but how do you choose what kind of a body to come into? Why do we come into a physical world? What's the point of this exercise? Besides unpacking creation, I think right now it's a huge exercise in learning tolerance. And how many of you have read Meetings with the Archangel by uh, Stephen Mitchell, who I think is Byron Katie's husband? Okay, there's, this, the book starts out with him having written a book called Against Angels, you know, not believing in angels. And so an angel shows up, and the whole book is a dialogue between the angel and the author, and, and also a treatise on Zen training and several other spiritual uh, paths. And it's called, the subtitle is A Comedy of the Spirit. And the angel basically says to the man at the end, um, we angels envy you humans. And, and a lot of psychics will say that the non-material entities are lined up for human bodies because this is such, a, such an important experience. The angel says, don't look to us angels for compassion because we can't feel passion, so how can we feel compassion, right? You are in a world of duality with emotions and, and concepts of good and bad and evil and all these things, and you feel all these vibrations that can only be felt in a physical body that we call emotions. And that's really important. That's growing the universe into an experience it can't get on non-material levels. So it makes it really important. 
So I find that by, by adopting the hypothesis that I chose to be here in this life at this time, then I know I wasn't coming for an easy, smooth ride, right? And it's okay then, right? <laughs> because I can blame it on myself. I could have stayed up there and been an angel and sat around on clouds thinking up different human dramas without going into them. And I do believe that a little over 500 years ago, the bunch of angels were sitting around saying, what do we play next? And somebody said, I know, cowboys and Indians. That'll be fun. It turns into conquistadors and native peoples. Let's do real shit to each other and see how long it takes us to love each other again. <laughs> We're still playing that game, right? We're still playing that game. You gotta, you know, it, it's, it's better to laugh than to cry about the situation that we're in. And as I said, you know, context, meaning is given by context. So every context has another context, right? It's all nested like the whirlpools. And so I'm a context chaser. And what happens is that you end up with the whole universe as the biggest context with all that is. And so that gives meaning to the whole universe then, or the whole universe gives meaning to everything within it. So here's an example of context. I was in China way back in 1974 and taken to a basketball game, and our Chinese hosts were jumping up and cheering at every basket, no matter which side was making it. And we're to, <laughs> for a while I was trying to figure out, and through the interpreter, like, what's your team? Which one is your team? What do you mean? <laughs> And finally, when he caught on to what I was saying, when I was explaining that in the West we only cheer for one side, oh, no, 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 the reason you pit two teams against each other is to drive excellence. And we applaud the excellence. You need... What if children in school, you wouldn't have to teach the coaches any kind of new game, or the parents, but everybody now uses this framework, this context, and then the team that makes the most baskets has to take the other team out for driving it to such excellence. Hello, cooperation. You don't have to get rid of competition, but you have to get rid of hostile competition about the framework in which you see things, the context. So we all have to build our own realities from these perceptions, from these stories. And the perceptions, as I said, always filtered through the stories. And so we have inner and outer sources. Our dreams can affect our perceptions as much as, uh, or our spiritual practices, as much as what comes in to vision and what, what translates into vision and hearing and all of those other things. And these beliefs and stories that we live by affect other people's realities. So it's a co-created thing. And we have a lot of responsibility in what our beliefs are, what our stories are. I think most facts, if not all of them, reduce to, to beliefs. And we have two kinds of beliefs in our vistas, as I call them, that's what my workshop was about. And they are the ones we think of as facts, what's really true in the world, right? And the ones that we call values, by which we negotiate our way among those facts. So we all have to define reality as a non-derivative experience and choose, choose our way, choose our stories, decide what to believe, weed out the beliefs that don't work for you anymore, plant new ones, just be conscious of them. And even scientists, maybe especially scientists, still have to decide what to believe. And that brings me to the second part, really, of the talk, about how Western science uh, perceives nature, defining it as accidental, non-living, meaningless, purposeless, as a mechanical universe running down by entropy, and then biology as an, uh, a, an endless struggle in scarcity, a fierce competition trying to run counter this, to this tide of entropy. So we have here a very depressing story, a very depressing story. No wonder that we have built, um, you know, consumer societies to comfort ourselves. That, it, that story may seem a little medieval to us, 
but it's hardly changed, especially in biology, which is still at the Newtonian level of physics with its little molecular machines and so forth. By the way, my little village has celebrations like this. It's these on-the-ground medieval fireworks are really fabulous to run around in. <laughs> so capitalists and communists, you know, politicized science. Science is the official creation storyteller, but the, but the two sides interpreted it differently. And the Darwinian competition was only adopted on, in, in the West and in the Soviet Union. Kropotkin wrote a book on mutual aid, all about cooperation in nature. So when I looked into nature, I looked into this a both-and situation. Is it possible that it's not that one side is right and the other side is wrong, but that there is actually, both of these actually exist in nature? And I asked myself questions like, what if Galileo had taken these newfangled lenses of his day and looked up down into a drop of pond water instead of up into the heavens with a telescope? He'd made a microscope, looked the other way. Because the heavens had already been identified as mechanics. And there were all these machine models of the planets and, and uh, so forth. And so I wondered if biology might have become the leading science and that, whether physics would have had to fit itself into a story of a living universe uh, instead of life having to fit itself into the story of the non-living universe. And um, I became an evolution biologist in order to be a deep pastist, as I said, uh, so that I could see where we've come from in order to look at what is the, are the possible trajectories for our future in linear time. And the ancient Greeks called science philosophias, lover of wisdom, and the whole point of science was to study nature in order to get gui guidance in human affairs. So that was always my purpose in studying science, but when I got to university, I found it wasn't widely shared. Um, anyway, to sum up what I have found as an evolution biologist about life is that there is an evolution cycle that's actually a maturation cycle that goes from competition to cooperation. And it goes something like this. There's a unity. There's a oneness. And from that oneness, individuation, or within that oneness, individuation happens. Okay? So, for example, the early Earth's crust is a bunch of homogenized minerals and, and bacteria form within that crust. And once you have individuation, tensions and conflicts are bound to happen because they are in different perspectives and situations, and these things arise. And so you, this is the Darwinian part of evolution. I call it the youthful part of a species' life. If the tension and conflict doesn't lead to wiping each other out, then occasionally there's some negotiations happening in the interactions. And as those negotiations continue, they sometimes lead to resolutions of problems. And then you've prepared the ground for cooperation to happen. And in the end, you get a new unity built at a larger size level. So we're going to start with the micro world in evolution and end up with a global human economy this way by going through these series of maturation cycles over time. The point at which, or not the point, but there is a process, there's an initiation to maturity, if you like, that happens when it gets too expensive to keep bumping off all your enemies. And that's what you're seeing now in the global economy. It's getting very expensive for the United States to keep fighting all these different wars. You know, we scared ourselves silly with World War I and II, and we haven't done a global war since World War II, but now we went back to doing local warfare, and it's not all over yet. So it becomes cheaper to feed your enemies at some point. Okay, now... Let me go back to when I was a graduate student in the 1950s at Syracuse University in the United States. And as a scientist, I had to take a philosophy of science course. And we had to write out a set of fundamental assumptions about a universe and then build a science on that. Okay? I'll show you how this works. Okay, so this is, this is sort of part two. 
about the perception of nature through science. These unproven assumptions are vital both to yourself to negotiate life, they're your basic story, your fundamental assumptions. And every society has them and it's called the creation story. And science has it because you cannot make a theory in a vacuum. You can't make a theory about a universe that you have no concept of. You, if, if it's a total mystery to you, the universe, then you can't make a theory about it. Okay, you have to have some notion. What is it that, that I'm studying here? Okay, so as I just said, no science is possible without a set of beliefs, assumptions that prove to be conceptions of the universe at a particular time of history in a particular culture. That's the only way you can do it. So Western science perceives the universe as non-living, as something you can study objectively from the outside, in which consciousness emerges after a long series of accidents of matter, and in which life, therefore, comes from non-life. Okay? That is the kind of assumptions that are made about the universe in order to theorize about it. That's its unproven cosmology. So, whether the universe is alive or non-living is a choice of belief, a choice of fundamental assumption. When I give lectures about the living universe, a scientist will walk up to me, wink, wink, loved your poetic metaphors. If you use biological metaphors, they're poetic. Uh, but this isn't really science, is it? And I say, why do you say that? I've learned the script. And he says, because you can't prove it. I say, prove what? You can't prove this is a living universe. Oh, interesting observation. Can you tell me how you proved this was a non-living universe? But they snap back. And they say, you don't have to. And I say, why is that? They say, because it's obvious. I say, it's not obvious to all human cultures. Well, of course not. That's because they're pre-scientific. Well, after that happened a couple of times, I decided they're not going to get away with this. <laughs> okay, got to do something about this. They don't know their assumptions from their results, right? And from, from their uh, research results. They haven't even been taught to distinguish them, really. So, why is it that if we can have such diametrically opposite assumptions in different cultures, different human cultures, that we only have one science? Why is it the Western science says, what do you mean, other science? That's another conversation I have often enough. Uh, d d science is science. You can't have another one. Well, all of the religions used to think that way about themselves. They were religion. The others were just had people with weird ideas, right, who didn't deserve to have them. But the religions now at least acknowledge each other and have world parliaments of religion. And science, Western science, is taught all over the globe in universities. And yet, they're not all believing the same fundamental story. And some of us are in this room who don't. So in the 1990s, Willis Harmon, who was head of uh, IONS, Institute of Noetic Sciences, and wrote Global Mind Shift and things like that, he and I were faxing each other when I lived on a Greek island 25 years ago, and there was no internet or any of that yet. And so he proposed that we should write a book on the question of if consciousness is not an emergent product of material evolution, but the source of the material world, how would biology and society change? And then out of that came our book, Biology Revisioned. So most living universe scientists believe that matter arises within mind or consciousness, as we've been talking about. We used to call that shabu which stands for science of the human being in its universe. Uh, you know, leading edge scientists, we used to get together and try to see if we could develop an integral science acknowledging that this was a science of how human beings perceive the universe and that we couldn't speak for beings, other beings, be beings other than human ones. So what Willis and I were talking about was, were we evolving Western science by expanding it so that standard science, um, 
you know, this matter energy non-life would be embedded within a larger science that took into account all of consciousness. Or were we talking about creating a whole new science that had a different set of fundamental assumptions? That's the kind of dialogues that we were having. And so in, in 2008, I convened the first international symposium on the foundations of science. It was held in Hokkaido, Japan. And everyone there had a PhD in Western science or philosophy of Western science um, and had made what we've been calling the paradigm shift that's represented in this conference. And I made them all write out all the fundamental assumptions they'd been taught and then all the fundamental assumptions they now held so that we had a clear different set of them. And like we had over a hundred on each side, and, you know, of different ways of seeing fundamental assumptions. So it was quite an interesting exercise to list them all. And during this symposium, I had an epiphany. I was teaching evolution biology as maturation out of conquest models into cooperation. And here, a paradigm shift was a conquest model, so it wasn't really a good mature solution to the problem to fight over, you know, which of these sciences is more valid than the other. So, whoa, that was quite a thought. Thomas Kuhn wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolution. One paradigm, one worldview, replaces the other over time. And I'm saying, can't do that. I'm about maturing from competition to cooperation, so I have to go from conquest to consortium. And I presented to the symposium the idea of why can't we have a global consortium of sciences where to qualify as a science, they have to use good methodology. They have to do theorizing and test the theories and get results and interpret them and all that. But the foundational belief story makes a very different science. You study different things in Vedic science than you study in Western science and, and Islamic science, and you, you have a different concept of the universe. So different sciences based on different cosmologies life arising from non-life by a series of fortuitous accidents or life arising by self-organization in a living universe, very different. So here's my consortium of sciences with equal validity and respect for each other built on acknowledged culturally diverse assumptions. In other words, one of the rules is to qualify to come into the consortium, you have to explicitly state what your fundamental assumptions are, rather than having people who learn science in universities, like my grandson, who's now a microbiologist and is completely in the Western science mode, but he was never taught to distinguish fundamental assumptions from research results. So this solution seems to me represents a mature kind of collaboration and a more fruitful division of labor in solving global problems. And I'll tell you why in a minute. And in 2009, the year after the Hokkaido Symposium, we held one in Kuala Lumpur for Islamic scientists to write down all their fundamental assumptions. Okay, so I had Western science, which is based on uh, the, the non-living universe and is very good at spinning off technologies that we love. I had the, basically Vedic science is where the paradigm shifters in the West got their fundamental assumptions from, was from India, when everybody went over there and learned a whole new cultural worldview. And now I had a third one, Islamic science, where the first uh, assumption is Allah created the universe. And the second one is Allah created a living universe. And the Quran says, study that living universe. Okay, they may understand biology better than the other two because the one is, is more about quantum physics and consciousness studied through the inside, whereas the Islamic scientists were told to study nature. So what happens if you only have the one science, Western science, is that we don't get only the good technologies that we love, they're, but they're not recyclable, for it's one problem with them. And the second problem is that Western science is messing in our food supply and our health in ways that turn out to be destructive. 
because they don't understand self-creation. They don't understand biology. They don't understand life. And that's why a global consortium of sciences is so important to promote, because we need another science who does understand life to stand up as equals and say, let's do a division of labor. We understand, we can, I said to the Islamic scientists, you, what, you won't get your credentials from Western science. You have to stand up and claim your right to do Islamic science and do something Western science hasn't done and do it so well that people acknowledge you for it. And my first suggestion would be do a real science of economics that's rooted in nature as holistic nature and then you will understand biology and, and be able to talk about economics in those terms. So we explored the assumptions of Islamic science and the possibilities for its unique contributions. We could have a Taoist science, uh, we could have indigenous sciences, because I've done a lot of work with indigenous people and they do medicine, they do agronomy, they do astronomy, they do physics, they do chemistry, they do biology, they do psychology, they do ecology. You know, they do, they, there are a lot of sciences there. And they did lots of formal experimentation, for instance, the pre-Inca cultures and the Inca in Peru. So there are so many ways of perceiving nature that we need these different sciences. And remember that seeing the earth as alive by definition is not something you have to prove. It's a concept. And then you do theories to test, does it behave like a living entity? But you have the right to do that as a fundamental assumption. We just conceive nature as organics rather than mechanics. And then we make the hypotheses about its physiology. So, me, I perceive evolution as an intelligent improvisational dance that we're all part of. And I perceive nature as profoundly conservative with the things that work well and radically creative when they don't. Our political opposition parties should be cooperating in the mature mode with a division of labor of protecting what works and changing what doesn't. Hello. After every great extinction, Species have been driven into mature mode. That's what crises do for us, and that's why I see crises as opportunity. And every natural disaster we have on this planet, you see 95 to 100 percent cooperation immediately. It's in our nature. And humans did this once before. It's not brand new. Ecologists see ecosystems as type ones called pioneer, in which species scarf resources, hog territory, multiply wildly, are very competitive, youthful mode, right? Okay, in a type three, they're like Kropotkinian instead of Darwinian because the species are sharing territory and resources and feeding each other and are very cooperative in rainforests and prairies and uh, coral reefs and, and things like that. So but they don't see it as a sequence. They don't see it because they deny that nature can learn. They deny that nature's intelligent. Can't go into more detail, but just to remind you, this is how the evolution cycle worked. We go through the youthful phase, and then when we realize that it's too expensive to bump off your enemy, we can go into cooperative mode. And I perceive humans as a kind of big brain experiment for which the results aren't in yet. <laughs> Big mind is trying us out. <laughs> and I wonder whether aliens would perceive us as intelligent when they look at what we're doing to each other and to our planet at present. And I ask, can we become our self-designated title of the wise ones who know that they know? <laughs> So I think it's our evolutionary mandate to create global sustainable economics and really become a global family that plays the whole keyboard. And I close with my favorite line from Rumi. Why do we stay in prison when the door is so wide open? Live the future now. <laughs>